right. Then we got five minutes till we get started. So, whatever. I don't know what that is, but I just turned it on. So, we will get started here in just a minute. As usual, I'm starting. Oh, look at that. And I think I found the comments right away. So we're doing something a little bit different, so we may get a little interruption occasionally, but we're live at the Blue Raven uh, Full Moon Market tonight that's getting started in about an hour, so some of the vendors are still getting set up. And I will say this 10, ten more times as we go. Got a couple of questions in the queue, so if you've got any questions, please go ahead and type them in the comments. Man, somebody's there. All right, good job. Um, so let us know who you are and uh, where you're from and type in any questions if you got them. All right, I think I actually, it's so much better than it used to be. It used to be so hard to find the comments and the chat box. So um, I will do a little scroll of this and I'll get started formally here in four more minutes. Yay, lots of cool classes coming up. Selfless promotion. Whoops, there we go. Keep it straight. Da, 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 da. Just like the Star Wars scroll. Wait, and there's all these great services that we provide at the clinic to include the weekly student intern cl clinic. Do, do, do. Wait, what's the address? There you go. You can tell the air conditioning is on. It's hot here in Florida in case you didn't know it. So hang out we're gonna just stall for a few minutes man people are jumping up on here all right come on there's five six of you in here so let me know who you are where you're from say hey post a question we'll get officially started here in three more minutes i gotta have my phone here so i can actually see when it's six o'clock i don't want to diss anybody by starting too early yay there we are kim in houston all right cool See, now that's good. That also let me know where to set it so I can see the chat. Ha! <laughs> Zelda, all right. I love it when we get people from all over the place. It's always cool to me. As much as I hate the internet, la, la, la. You know what? Being able to connect with people all over the country and sometimes all over the world as we do this is kind of cool. It's this the appropriate use of stuff. Well, Kim, Zelda, feel free to post any questions if you got them, and uh, I will throw them into the mix as we go here. All right. That's awesome. Oh, an RN. Bonus. You're allowed to say medically stuff, too, even though I'm going to talk crazy energetic stuff. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> For now, you know, you can enjoy this once a month, or if you're taken any of our classes we do do all of our classes by zoom as well live and in person just like this except I actually have a PowerPoint and slides then all right make sure I know what the heck I'm talking about here for the next hour and I'm sorry that for those of you who are not you know in you know a stone's throw I am gonna shut this down right at eight if not a few minutes hey pickles uh, and do an herb walk here uh, during the full moon market right after we're done with this. And then I'm going to pass out because I have to teach this weekend. All right, a minute to go. So my stalling is almost over. Da, 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 da. Let's see how many millions of people. Oops, I messed up. There we go. Oh, man, we already got a good gang on here. That's awesome. All right, I think I got it all primed. There we go. Da, 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 da. All right, cool. So I'm going to call that 6 o'clock. It's close enough for government work because by the time I stop saying this, it will actually be 6 o'clock. If you don't know, I'm Bob Lindy. Uh, I'm a registered herbalist and an acupuncture physician here in oh-so-sunny <laughs> uh, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. 
and uh, I am from the Tradition School of Herbal Studies, where we teach Western and Chinese herbal medicine, all the way from beginner through clinician, to include uh, at least a year of clinical practice for all of our students, where they meet once a week with people from the community, trying to figure out how to best help them with all of their various issues. Um, and also acupuncture and herbal therapies, where we have a multi-practitioner practice with herbalists and acupuncturists um, with a variety of specialties and services, all of them. Um, we also have one energy worker, we have Qigong classes, um, and not yet allergy elimination. We do just herbal consults sometimes because it's not always necessary to do acupuncture as well as vitamin and homeopathic injections. If you don't know, we're at 2520 Central Avenue in St. Petersburg, Florida, and you can find out more about the clinic at acuherbals.com, only one C in acu, A-C-U-H-E-R-B-A-L-S.com, and the school is at 6340 Central Avenue also in St. Petersburg, and you can find out more about it at traditionsherbschool.com. <gasps> All right, um, exciting classes coming up, just to put on your calendar if anybody's interested, the Flower Essence, it's a certification class, um, so it's a couple of weekends long. We're not going to offer that on Zoom, um, but the first one is August 26th, 27th. Um, next weekend is the physical assessment class that I'm teaching with Tricia who um, has more skill than me in the physical assessment realm. Uh, so for every physical assessment issue that we evaluate, I'm gonna do my very best to talk about the herbs for both prevention and treatment, each one of those uh, physical uh, um, orthopedic kind of issues that we may run across. Uh, definitely is more geared towards the practitioner, super appropriate for acupuncturists uh, or herbalists, uh, massage therapists. We don't offer CEUs for them because it's a pain. Um, and then on July 13th uh, is medicine making where we do uh, a two hours intense uh, study of a particular herb, make some medicine with it, talk about its history and uses and all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, so on July 13th, I think that's a great choice, corn silk. So Ruthie will be teaching that. Uh, anatomy for the herbalist. So every month we focus on another body system. This time it will be the immune system, which Trisha teaches and is always awesome. Also, and it's always called young woman's herbal. We still haven't changed that. It's the young persons. You are not, it is not gender specific, specific in any way. So July 28th will be soothing and cooling. So looking at how to... Uh, chill out over the summer and enjoy your your uh, summer break. We generally say generically it's kind of a 15 to 25 year olds, um, but geared a little bit more towards the teenager than it is for the adult the way most of our classes are. July 28th will be our next open forum and da -da -da, lots of cool stuff after that and I won't bother to babble about them because they're so far away and we'll say it in the next class, but you can find out more information on our uh, website at traditionsherbschool.com. All right, that, I think that was enough of the selfless promotion for anybody who hasn't seen us before. This is, we started this during uh, the pandemic and I decided I liked it and I wasn't gonna stop. Uh, so it's an opportunity for me to reach out and try my very best in two hours to answer some of those questions that people have. Super appropriate at any level. I don't mind whether you do it in energetic or physical medicine, Western medicine kind of term. We can talk Western or Chinese herbs and, you know, I know a smattering of other stuff, uh, probably with a specialty to, in Caribbean uh, and our bioregional plants that grow around here. So I definitely like talking about all our local stuff in particular. Uh, I try not to go too crazy Chinese medicine on you because it's not as many acupuncture or Chinese herbal folks on here. So I, I tend to focus on the Western and I tend to uh, always focus in on energetics and safety when we're talking about this stuff. Oh, I know what I didn't talk about. Um, cool conferences are coming up. So uh, the FASOMA, for those of you who are acupuncturists in this one, it, it's funny. Most every other year, it's appropriate. Sometimes it's just really appropriate for acupuncturists or folks uh, in acupuncture school. 
usually on the off years when we're not doing relicensure, there's enough eclectic classes that for people who are just studying Chinese herbal medicine, super appropriate to jump in. This one's definitely a relicensure year for us to get our CEU, so it's very ACU heavy. Um, so this uh, this year it's in Fort Lauderdale, which is always fun because I think we're across the street from the beach. I get to go swimming in the Atlantic, uh, August 25th through the 27th. And I'm going to be teaching, uh, of course, something herbal. Uh, we're going to be looking at the orthopedic uses of Western and Chinese herbs, both internally and externally. Um, and if we get a chance, we're going to talk, uh, talk a little bit about that stuff tonight. Um, also, the AHG uh, a national conference is coming up on October 13th through the 16th in Granby, Colorado. I just got my tickets the other day, so I'm super psyched. I'm not teaching at that one. AHG does a really good job. They ask if we taught last year not to teach this year, and it gives an opportunity for um, a lot of fresh faces and some of those up-and-coming herbalists and some of those local herbalists to get in. So. Um, I go anyway. I think it's an important to support our profession, uh, and the American Herbalist Guild is our professional organization uh, that supports us and makes sure that we have great opportunities. I encourage everybody to join. You don't need any special designation to join the American Herbalist Guild. You could be a student member or general member, um, and ideally everybody's working towards the criteria to become a professional member. That's that cool RH, the Registered Herbalist that's after my name. Uh, although it looks intimidating, it's very doable. You just kind of sit there and go through it, um, really geared towards the clinician, but they've set up some new categories that I don't know enough about. Um, do I, oh, all right. Woohoo. Uh, Thomas. Um, uh, and so the, it's, the other categories are trying, AHG's trying really hard. I got that one, Kim. I'm going to add it to the list. Um, and we definitely got a bunch of stuff we can talk about for hematomas. Um, and also, if you're in the local area, and that can be a pretty wide range, we usually say swift mud, but it, I don't care where you're from, you're welcome to join us. Uh, the next AHG chapter, so we have a local chapter meeting that kind of meets the Southwest Water Management uh, District, seven county area. Um, and that is, I'm going to say tentatively because I don't think we've actually published it yet, but that's what we're planning on doing is July 22nd here at the school at 5.30. And um, I have no idea what we're gonna cover. I think we're, we're trying to sucker Alex, uh, the herb ninja, uh, to uh, come and do a little presentation and maybe a, not a show and tell, but if anybody has like little 10 minutes uh, vignettes that they want to uh, share about their herbal knowledge, something unique that they can bring to the table. Um, I think they're going to try to put something together like that. And if I seem more crazy than usual, um, it's been a busy couple of days, uh, and I didn't write that down. Part of it is I spent the last two days playing out in the sun, and if you're not from around here, it's hot out. It's been like 400% humidity and a million degrees. Uh, there's not enough water for us to drink, and it's a really sad thing, and it's dangerous, honestly. Uh, it's a heat wave here throughout the south, but uh, in Florida as well. But when the humidity gets up, uh, the sweat doesn't evaporate. And the way our body cools off is through evaporation. So you really have to drink massive amounts of water and find a way to cool your body off. Uh, and there's no good answers for that. So uh, I'm happy to say I didn't get any kind of heat injuries, which I am famous for not taking care of myself when it comes to heat. Uh, we had to dig out an old tree stump in preparation because hopefully uh, in, before August, we will have our permitting to start our build out here at the school so that we can move both the clinic and all the apothecary over here. Don't worry for any of you who come to the apothecary, we'll make sure everybody knows that when we're officially moved over here, but we're looking at around the first of the year, hopefully a little bit sooner, um, but it is a work in progress. It'll be uh, my first time I've actually built something specific for the clinic so that we can have clinic space. So I've got really cool stuff in the plans and I'm very excited to be showing it off to the masses and to have the garden that's out back here 
um, available for our patients to go and sit and relax before or after their treatment is very exciting. Oh yeah, and so wait, I gotta move something here. Um, so you know, I'm making jokes because I'm very well caffeinated today, and uh, I stopped at the clinic because I had to write an article for the Florida State Oriental Medicine Association, that's FISOMA for acupuncturists, um, about orthopedic herbs. And I noticed that we have, um, we have a little section I at the clinic that our students and graduates, if they have a product line that they're able to, um, petition's the wrong word, but we have criteria they have to meet so that we can put their stuff uh, out for sale for them to help promote it. And uh, today we had one that um, I'm partial to because it's super yummy, um, it's good for you and all that. But one of our current students, <coughs> had a little break in, in her process, uh, is a bit fascinated with cacao. And right before the pandemic, she opened up a company called Ratza uh, Chocolate. And uh, we took the HG chapter up there for one of our monthly events and got a behind the scenes tour of how they were sourced, some of the history. Uh, and she took us step by step through the whole roasting and manufacturing process of her small batch and I will say award-winning she just took second place for cool new product at International Herb Conference but has a gold medal and some other things so I am currently enjoying some of this really yummy coffee and she had a couple of different bars out there um, but because this one had some brain food in there and to push a little bit today I uh, you know between chopping up and moving some wood, shoveling three yards of uh, black dirt and spreading those around the garden so that we were ready for the Blue uh, Raven full moon market tonight, writing the article and making it back here with questions and be vaguely coherent, I needed a little extra something and I didn't have time for coffee, so. <laughs> uh, yes, hey, hey, Tabitha, <laughs> yeah, we got it at the clinic. It literally just went in today, um, so. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to have a hard time keeping it in stock because y'all know about it and we all want some. So, um, But it's it's really nice. We've got uh, a number of our regulars there, but we have a nice rotating uh, group of products from a variety of our students and graduates, and they're all really excited to work towards getting those products in there. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Um, so I had an interesting question, and I don't talk about it a whole lot, but there was a question about carnivorous plants. And... Um, there are literally hundreds of different uh, carnivorous plants uh, around the world. Uh, there are the Droseras, are the ones a lot of people are familiar with, which are your sundews, your Venus flytraps, things like that. And I think there's like 800 species or something in the, in the Droseras. Um, but also, and I totally forget the Latin name for pitcher plants, but they're in there somewhere. Uh, and there's a whole slew of different types of pitcher plants uh, we have uh, a number of uh, carnivorous plants that grow here in Florida, but I'm going to preface all of this by saying I don't recommend harvesting uh, from the wild any of the carnivorous plants. They tend to be, um, because of uh, the destruction of their habitat, the draining of swamps, uh, and ultimately the over harvesting because of the novelty of having a carnivorous plant. There isn't enough out there to harvest uh, in large amounts uh, to put into use. Um, there is, I, I can safely say I don't use uh, carnivorous plants in my practice. Um, I know of them, but when we have a worldwide variety of plants that we can access, any practitioner can. Um, I tend to, even if I think a particular carnivorous plant might be helpful in a case, I can always find something that is equally as effective. That said, um, it, it is just because I don't want to harvest or I don't want to use a particular plant, uh, doesn't mean I don't want to learn about it, know about it. Uh, and if somebody had some, I would certainly take a tincture of it or, or nibble on a little bit and hope that it doesn't nibble back. Um, but I believe the sundews are more commonly used. It has a longer, and I'm going to say the Droseras in general, um, they're 
primarily expectorants that are used for cough, um, and the uh, Venus flytrap, fly which is in that realm. And I think that might be the, oh, nope, that was something else. Um, I was waiting for a text message about the uh, HG chapter meeting. The Venus flytrap in particular has been researched uh, specifically for cancer. That said, um, the question that I was sent was specifically about pitcher plants. And so less of a history of using the pitcher plants. Um, but there is some, and with pitcher plants, they do grow throughout the world. So what we find is there are some unique species in the realm, uh, some in China, uh, some in Scandinavia, and a few others that had both culinary uses, oddly enough, as well as medicinal uses. Things that we saw um, kind of uh, when we look at the range of different ways that it could be used. Uh, different parts of the plant can be used for different functions. Um, we saw a lot of antimicrobial action, um, which we also see with the sundews, the Draceras. Um, we see that it is used for phlegm, so all of them seem to help with phlegm. The digestive juices that are in the, the base of the pitcher um, are also used to minimize scar formation. And not that we don't want you to heal, but what oftentimes happens is when uh, people are healing up and it, they're either prone towards keloids or they're uh, prone to just getting like really rough looking scars, it's very common to use some sort of a digestive enzyme. So in this case, they're using the stomach acid of a pitcher plant to soften the school to minimize the scarring. We also see that with something a little bit more common and more tropical, and that is things like papaya. Uh, the digestive enzymes are used in the same way. A after a scar is formed and you know it's still creating that new growth, to soften the edges and to keep the tissues underneath the scar formation uh, functional and limber, uh, papaya is used topically as well as um, pineapple, the bromelain in pineapple. So certainly we can eat them, but they're used topically. And so the pitcher plant juices were used topically for that. Um, it was also used for digestion. And under that heading, uh, the whole plant was used for uh, diabetes to help with blood sugar and um, sugar carbohydrate digestion. But also kind of a side effect of that uh, it was used for constipation. So it was a, and I'm going to say gentle poop mover. Hey, Danielle. Um, and yeah, I should say, ooh, I got, I see, we got a bunch of new people. Anybody just jumping on, say hey, let us know where you're from and post any questions you got. Um, what else was it used for? Ah, and for both the, the sundews as well as the pitcher plants, they were both uh, there's some description of them for TB, small pack, smallpox, and um, uh, venereal diseases. And what I can safely say is there are so many herbs that are supposed to cure those things because they were such a scourge uh, for humanity up until very recently that things like smallpox decimated huge populations. TB destroyed lots of uh, people in the cities in, in close confinement. Um, and uh, you know, one of the many gifts that we brought from the old world to the new uh, was a variety of venereal diseases um, that again, uh, <laughs> um, uh, created lots of difficulty. And up until the creation of antibiotics, um, there wasn't a lot that helped any of these diseases. So what we saw was a lot of herbs, uh, a lot of toxic metals like mercury, yay, um, were being touted as cures for uh, the plague, smallpox, and, and so forth. The reality is, they're generally not a cure. Um, modern research has not proven those out. Uh, so, we, you know, one of those, we always have to take it in context and um, 
you're, it's totally appropriate to believe, but verify. So look to see if the research is out there to support it. In this case, it was symptom suppression that some of these things helped with, in particular, some of the pustules and other fun stuff that came with uh, smallpox, with TB. It helped uh, people to breathe a little bit better, but they were still going to deal with the TB. Um, and, and it's one of the it's one of the tricks as we read this stuff. People make these extravagant claims, um, even in the modern research, uh, as new things show up. And too often, it's people repeating other people, you know, yay, TikTok. Um, but even more so, it's a test tube study. And test tube studies tend not to be accurate by any stretch of the imagination. Test tube studies, the in vitro studies, are uh, a good starting point to start further research and potentially even to do uh, human studies in the future, especially if it's something we know to be safe, um, to see whether it can have those positive benefits. But the reality is a lot of things are done in test tubes, are somebody looking to get their PhD thesis, and are never intended to be taken further than a good research paper published in some obscure journal. People are prone to grab hold of those things and say this cures Lyme disease, malaria, uh, the plague, and you name it. And um, we need to be very cautious and look for multiple sources, um, the in vivo studies, and then even with the in vivo studies to see whether they're actually using an herb or a chemical alkaloid extraction. Uh, I was just researching an herb at darn if I can remember what it was. Somebody had asked me about it and I was like, I have no idea what that is. And so I started doing some research and I actually found two or three studies. But what I found was all they were doing was extracting a chemical from a plant, concentrating it in this isolated chemical form and then injecting it into people and they got some positive results. That has nothing to do with the plant itself. The uh, actions that we'll get out of the thousands of chemicals and unique compounds that are in every plant be very different and perhaps better outcomes than than what they found with the isolated compound um and actually let me do hem hematoma is easy so um hematoma is a, a fancy talk for bruising um and usually when we think about a hematoma it's more than just a little ow uh, those can be more severe, um, oftentimes turning purple, swollen. They can be internal or external, which is always in interesting. Um, you know, we can have, uh, oh, my favorite thing to say, the subdermal hematoma, which is literally a bruise inside your, the dural lining inside your brain, which we don't see on the outside. You get a good conk on the head, maybe you get a little bump on the outside, um, but there could be some brain swelling that's going on in the inside. Funny, one of my interns, uh, I forget what happened, but she gave herself a good ding in the head where it was so bad. She did it right before she came to clinic. So she's supposed to be in there seeing clients and it looked like somebody hit her in the head with, uh, a, not a baseball bat, it wasn't quite that bad. Uh, no, forearm just below the L. Ooh, rough. Um, that sounds horrid. So, uh, she was concerned, and the problem was that she's a little ADHD, and so she's a little spacey, but was she more spacey than usual was the question. So when we get a brain uh, bruise, a hematoma, um, visible or invisible, we always have to be concerned. So certain warning signs we look for, stuff leaking out of your ears would be bad. All of these are like, you should go to the hospital. We look at the eyes. Um, if there's unequal, you know, one pupil's big, one's small, that means you should go to the ER. Uh, and if you want to get fancier, you take a little pen light or flashlight and you see if the eyes respond where they go, you know, when, when we take the light and go on and off of it, the eye pupil should change in shape. Those should react about the same. Um, I would say if there's a loss of consciousness, um, it's worth going to the ER just to get checked out. Certainly, if they don't remember who they are, or what day it is, what happened, that's definitely grounds for it. The problem with a head injury like that, where the brain swelling may 
increase over the space of 24, 48 hours. They may appear fine in the first few hours, and then as that swelling exerts pressure on the brain, they may literally 12, 24 hours, that's when the symptoms really show up, they're scary. So that's something we monitor every couple of hours or ideally, you know, the hospital frequently keep you overnight even for a good conk on the head. Uh, yeah, and so concussion, yes. Uh, good that all of that's fine. Um, and so my next thing about hematomas, and sorry, I, I, I'll talk specifically about, man, he got busted up on a bicycle wreck, but uh, I wanna talk hematomas in general. So there are different reasons for bruising hematoma. The obvious is I fell down, fell off my bike, got busted up and, and badly bruised. Um, always we wanna make sure that there is um, not a break. So bruise is not life-threatening per se, but you know sometimes the, the swelling, we're not getting good range of motion. So if, if we suspect that there is a break and not just at the area where the bruise is, but actually checking all the way around. So if he fell on his elbow, let's say he got a big old ding here, they're like, oh, they took a picture of his elbow and it's fine. But a lot of times there can be a break further up at the shoulder or even the collarbone. So if they did a good job in the ER, they took a picture of kind of everything around there. Um, certainly by now, two weeks later, you would know. Uh, Michael had just wandered by actually. Um, yeah, people are going to be wandering in and out because we've got the full moon market going on here as well. He uh, was riding his bike for almost a year coming to work and uh, getting everywhere. He was really proud of himself that like he's getting all this great exercise. And St. Pete, unfortunately, is not very bike friendly and got knocked off by a car, um, slammed into the curb. And at first he didn't know it, but turns out he had a, a hairline fracture on his collarbone, which that would be bad. Um, the other reason why people, if somebody is like, man, I'm getting all these weird bruises, I don't understand. It can be a sign of anemia, uh, or it can be a sign of a vitamin C deficiency. And so for folks who are like, they bump up against the, the counter and all of a sudden have this huge bruise, uh, that can be an issue that needs to be checked out. If you uh, got a poor digestion, uh, where you have low stomach acid, you may be not absorbing your iron or your B12. Uh, if you're eating a vegetarian or vegan diet, not getting a full range of stuff and taking a little extra uh, B12, that might be a cause. Um, there's a slew of other reasons why you might be anemic. Those are the two most common. Uh, so that can be checked out to why you're getting frequent bruises or hematomas. But let's just say traumatology, dang, I busted my elbow up and it still hurts like hell and it's, it's a mess. Um, so a couple things, if there's not any deep wound on it, I love comfrey topically uh, for any kind of hematoma like that. Uh, so a lot of times the skin isn't really broken. Putting comfrey on a deep wound is a bad idea, but a little road rash is fine. Um, the using alternating hot and cold. So literally you can do um, a hot bucket of water and a cold bucket of water and literally just go back and forth. Um, that we've all seen it where we get a big hard lump and it's dark purple for a couple of days and it starts to get like, it looks like a rainbow at some point and spreads out. That's the body doing its repair job. Um, and ultimately that stuff has to be picked up either by the bloodstream or the lymphatic system, usually lymph system. Um, and so by doing that alternating hot and cold, we can help that out. Um, using lymphatic herbs can be really helpful to move things along as far as um, red clover, um, I'm gonna say generically bitter things. I love cleavers, chickweed. Um, all of those can be used topically or internally. Calendula can also be used internally uh, or externally. You can do a salve with that. Um, from a Chinese perspective, there's a ton of what we call blood moving herbs. Um, things like Angelica Dunguai as nice and gentle. Um, oops, and I, 
I'm going to say crazy words that nobody knows what the hell I said. Sorry, I got to make sure I type them. So, Dung Guai uh, is nourishes blood. That's actually a type of Angelica. Xuan uh, is one of the uh, classic blood movers. Um, I believe that's a Ligustricum. And uh, my personal favorite, Hong Hua. I'll use topically especially for bruising and oops, helps if I know how to type jer um, are all good choices, um, especially topically. Then we don't have to worry about herb drug interactions. Internally on some of these can be more challenging. Um, I don't recommend comfrey internally ever. Um, calendula. Uh, is generally considered safe. It can be a little hard on the stomach, and if they're on acid reflux meds, you may not get the real benefit out of it. The uh, cleavers and chickweed, I consider those food. Um, I don't see any potential scary things with that. The um, red clover I mentioned might interfere, like there was chemotherapy or something involved, there might be some concerns. If they had some hormonal uh, odd disruption, the potential is there, but not a big scary generally. Um, I said that when I said that. Uh, with the Chinese herbs that I mentioned, the Dongguai, uh, Dongguai is very hormonally active, so if they were on some sort of hormone suppressor, it would be an issue. With any of the Chinese blood movers, I would be concerned mildly concerned, but concerned nonetheless, internally, if they were uh, on any kind of blood thinner. Any other worries with that? Nah, those are the biggies. Um, you know, it bring, when we talk about herb drug interactions, uh, we use the term narrow therapeutic margin on uh, the, sorry, I'm scrolling back and making sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, good. Um, and, and I saw the CT scan and ortho did all the fancy checks. Um, so that's all good. Hopefully he's getting his use back. Um, oops. So blood thinners. Okay. So I would skip, if he's on blood thinners, I would definitely skip the uh, Chinese herbs except for topically. Topically, there is no concern whatsoever. And the blood thinners, of course, would make this bruising way worse. Uh, <laughs> so even if it had been a mild thing, it would be like dramatic. Um, and so the alternating hot and cold is great. The cleavers and um, chickweed is totally fine to do internally. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, what else did I say? The comfrey topically is totally OK. Um, and if he's able to without pain, and, and that's like, I always say, if it hurts, don't do it. Your body's telling you stuff. But if he can do any kind of movement with his arm without inflicting pain, um, the calendula is probably okay. It would really depend on the type of blood thinners that he's on. If he's taking an aspirin, yeah, sure. Uh, if he's taking, um, uh, the Coumadin, I would probably say no, just out of a general, being generally cautious and not knowing him or why he's taking them. Uh, the, so I would say, uh, I, I would probably stay away from the calendula internally. Externally is totally fine. Um, ah, so it was also hard for him to straighten it out. So that can be a muscle spasm uh, that's causing that to have uh, an issue. So using um, kava uh, topically is also appropriate. He, could, he can have some internally too if you got some kava. Um, but kava is, uh, kava kava, um, um, piper methysticum is probably one of my favorite anti-spasmodics. Uh, and he may have dinged his um, this is funny, that was my, one of my questions on here was about orthopedic antispasmodic analgesics. Uh, also, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Solomon seal. 
Um, Solomon's seal is great for repairing and nourishing the tendons. Um, so if there was some sort of just bruise or overstretched tendon, um, I would be all about the Solomon seal. Again, super safe internally. Um, and, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. and yeah, if he kind of damaged his elbow a little bit where there's just kind of... So when we think about... Um, Solomon seal it has many functions, but kind of think synovial fluid and nourishing and strengthening tendons. Uh, Arnica topically is fine. Um, there is also homeopathic Arnica, um, which is most of the Arnica out there. Um, so a homeopathic, I would say, is totally fine to do internally. If it's been two weeks, it's probably you're past the time where it would have done its most good. Um, it, Arnica is magical for that, I'm going to say, first week and, and does its very best uh, work in the first three days uh, prior to an injury. Um, uh, it's the homeopathic Arnica is one of those things that I give to people prior to going in for surgery, if they know it, um, and then as soon as they're able to post-surgical and have seen it just speed up healing, reduce the pain and swelling, after two weeks, it's like, eh, it won't hurt nothing. Uh, but Arnica by itself, the plant Arnica, um, was it Arnica Montana or something like that, um, I is considered a medium toxicity herb, although it's a good herb. Um, topically, it's great. I'm very hesitant to use it as a whole plant internally unless absolutely necessary. In a case like this, not so much. Um, but homeopathic and where it'll say Arnica and it'll have like C or an XX after it, that's its dilution. So homeopathics are different from herbal and um, equally as beneficial sometimes. Um, so totally okay to do those uh, if he's got a salve or something on there, it's fine. Um, the more he's able to A, just elevate to get all the lymph and blood to drain out, uh, the more he's able to move his muscles and so whether it's like this uh, whether it's making a fist whether it's going like this anything he can do will help move the lymph because our lymph works from uh, breathing and muscle contraction Ooh, hey Alexis um, basil's actually a, a wonderful anti-inflammatory um, it has a mild uh, pain-killing, analgesic, and antispasmodic effect. Uh, it is, um, I think, better internal than external and focuses mostly on the digestive system. Um, so although it does have anti-inflammatory, I think of it as digestive inflammation rather than uh, musculoskeletal. I'm sure it has some benefit. Um, yeah, my computer's being weird today. Um, so if you're eating inflammatory foods, then eating a bunch of basil with it is great. In particular, if either stress or food is causing abdominal distension and discomfort, it doesn't have to be gas. It could literally be like, for a lot of folks, me included, um, stress gives me like a, a stress belly. Um, and so just in nothing flat I hold all my stress in here and it can create some discomfort tension pain under the ribs uh, and basil and it's funny when we look at basil we just think yay basil let's make some pesto um, but we've got everything from holy basil to African tree basil to all of those southern European basils um, Thai basils you name it uh, they all have similar properties where we see the more acrid holy basil, still the same genus, um, and we can still make pesto out of it. Uh, the holy basil is better for stress. It's much stronger in stress and if there's phlegm, where the Italian or sweet basil is milder uh, and not as drying. So somebody may be tended towards constipation, but still has those positive benefits for stress. Um, better for aiding in digestion, uh, adding that into, you know, we can do a little chiffonade of, of some fresh basil to add into any meal, uh, can be beneficial and reduce the inflammation that some of our yummy foods may cause. 
do. Good questions, by the way. All right, I'm making sure I didn't miss anybody. I always got to scroll back a little bit. Man, we're cranking out. All right, we already got, you know. And if you're just joining us, and it looks like we've got a nice crowd here, um, feel free to let us know who you are, where you're from, and uh, type in any questions that you would like me to cover. And if not, I'll keep babbling about all the crap I got here written down to, for us to jump into. Um, oh, and you know, I forgot about the other thing. Uh, oh God, so bad. Uh, one of the uh, nice things you can do a bath out of basil is a wonderful. Hey, yeah, just please, yeah, join the party. You know, you're everyone's. There's 20 people online, but oh. <laughs> um, so one of the fun things about basil is making a bath out of it. And certainly, you can take a bunch of basil and throw it in uh, a handful into your bathtub and infuse your tub. Um, that gets a little messy because you got to clean things up. Uh, but if you put it in a little muslin bag, make a big old pot of tea and then put it in your bath, it's great as a nice way to relax and just soothe some of those muscles. Um, and weird historical thing, I, I used to teach uh, about aphrodisiac herbs around Valentine's Day just for fun. Basil in Italy was used to mark the homes of prostitution. Uh, it was an invitation if you put the basil out on your windowsill. Um, so. Uh, there, there's so many benefits, and one of the things I always like to think about digestion, uh, when we look at all the aphrodisiac foods oh, in most cultures, especially historically, there's different ones that we see now. Um, historically, people had horrible dental hygiene and um, a lot of digestive issues because we didn't have refrigeration 500 years ago. So a lot of our aphrodisiac herbs were things that were carminatives that helped with digestion, bloating, and stinky breath. Because uh, nobody wants to get near you if your belly hurts, you're farting, and your breath stinks. So <laughs> basil is good for all of those things. Um, you know, if you're enjoying some garlic on a date, make sure you chew the basil up. All right, let's do a local, um, and feel free to shout any questions as I babble along here. <laughs> There's not a true ag agenda to any of this. Um, so some of you, if you're in the Florida area, may have noticed that we've had our first four cases of malaria that are um, from Florida. And it's something I've been screaming from the rooftop for a while now, that as we see, you know, my running joke is climate change is great. I can grow tropical plants here where before it was really challenging. Um, and I've been constantly saying that those tropical diseases like chikungunya, dengue fever, malaria, those are going to become normal here in Florida and we're not used to addressing those both as a culture for prevention, uh, we're not used to dealing with those herbally, uh, and our medical system's not really that used to or prepared to detect when we have acute or chronic uh, mosquito-borne diseases like that. And uh, up until now, most of the cases of things like malaria were people who had traveled to Central South America, the Caribbean, flew back in, and then they showed up a few days after they returned with malaria. So they didn't come from a mosquito here. Um, we'd had a few isolated cases in southernmost Texas in the swamps and in Key West and uh, Miami area, but nothing that was consistent nor common until this year. So Sarasota County had their first four cases. Um, and one of the things that was not reported that actually frightens me a little bit, there is a known genus of mosquitoes that carries the malaria virus. It's jumped genuses. It's in a different species, or I should say species. It's in a different species of uh, mosquito than we've seen it before. Uh, and it's in a mosquito that's more common here. So that's kind of normal, but also kind of creepy because that means, uh, that's probably going to expand very quickly. So, yay, now we have something else to be afraid of. Um, so malaria is very common in a lot of countries, but it also is an issue. Uh, it's more common in uh, places with a lot of standing water, swamps, and so forth. The mosquitoes are most likely, of course, to get you when mosquitoes are most prevalent. So in the morning, uh, that uh, maybe hour before sunrise uh, and after sunrise and about an hour before sunset, like right now, uh, an hour after sun sunset. So protecting yourself a little bit extra, uh, making sure you're wearing 
clothing, covering mosquito nets. If you're camping, make sure you're not just camping out in the open. Uh, make sure your, your tent has screens on it. I am not a fan of mosquito repellents that use uh, chemical repellents like DEET. Um, that is a neurotoxin that makes me very sick. Uh, and when I see parents spraying that, you know, something that's literally a, 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 a cumulative neurotoxin on their children, I'm overly horrified. Uh, so there are some natural products as well that can be utilized. And there's pros and cons to all of them. Some work better than others. I don't have an opinion. Also, a B vitamin deficiency can make you extra um, tasty to the mosquitoes. I believe it's specifically B6. Um, back, <laughs> back in the day, people used to get B6 injections before they would go into the Amazon or something. Um, and it seemed to help a little bit. Uh, some of you have pets may know, like, yes, give the dog um, brewer's yeast to keep the fleas off of them, or a little extra garlic, even though it's too much as toxic to doggies. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but um, brewer's yeast is high in B vitamins. And so that's one of those ideas. And if you ever eat a lot of garlic, you know you actually reek of garlic. So it comes out of your skin pores. So those stinky foods like that, um, I, I haven't done the research, but the other one that's famous for making you smell funny, which probably makes you smell bad to mosquitoes, is fenugreek. Anybody who eats a lot of fenugreek or put fenugreek tea or fenugreek cookies because it tastes like maple syrup makes you a kind of gross, uh, sweet-smelling sweat that may uh, also keep the mosquitoes away. There are, it's funny, because we're not used to treating malaria, I would say look to those countries that are used to treating malaria. Uh, and you know the quinine water that the English made famous, that comes from a plant that was discovered in South America, that for all practical purposes is no longer viable, not because it doesn't work, but because it's been so overly harvested, there's not enough quinine uh, out there for us at, what is it, Chinchona. Uh, it, and bark it, is not enough out there for us to make it viable. Most of your tonic water, unless you go to the health food store and buy fancy stuff, has little to no quinine in it. Um, and so as much as the English loved gin and tonics and claimed it was for the malaria, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's other things that we can use uh, in a similar fashion. Unfortunately, it's challenging to use them as prevention. Usually we're going to be using those for treatment. The most famous one is uh, Sweet Annie, uh, Artemisia annua, and it's also a part of Chinese medicine called Ching Hao. Um, and Ching Hao, the exact same plant, the, um, I believe it was a woman, uh, got a Nobel Peace Prize a number of years ago and isolated a compound from there called Artemisian, <clears throat> which of course somebody has a patent on now, um, because it was found that Artemisian was 99.9% .9 for real, I'm not even exaggerating, uh, successful in the treatment of malaria. And the World Health Organization bought up uh, crap tons of it. Oh! Uh, bought up crap tons of it and started to distribute it throughout uh, Africa and Asia. And a few years ago, we saw um, an unfortunate thing because anytime money's involved in stuff, somebody's going to try to make a buck. So what happened was shadier people getting the Artemisian, diluting it, selling it, distributing it. So now uh, a few years ago, we saw our first uh, cases of malaria that were um, now resistant to the Artemisian. The Chinese have been using Sweet Annie for a thousand years, and they didn't isolate the alkaloid out of it. They used the whole plant. And I can safely say that I have given, and it's not considered prevention. Um, it is designed for treatment. That said, I've used it for a number of people going to India, uh, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Um, I've used it for kind of prevention, and so far no one's gotten malaria. And probably, I don't know, it's more than 20, less than 50 people I've had do it. 
Um, my best example was a, a group that was going to East Africa um, in a, trying to help um, some folks in some very uh, depressed area. Malaria was rampant in this area. So some of them took the prescription drugs, which are about 60-ish percent successful. And I will say, you know, I've taken them myself in the past. Uh, military doesn't give you a big choice on that. Uh, and despite the okay success, the biggest concern with the malaria prescription medications, some of them can cause psychotic breaks about a week or two after you start taking them. So you basically lose your mind in a third world country, uh, end up in prison where they take away your non-essential medications, and you come out of it and going, how did I get here? Um, so there are some downsides to it and a limited success rate. So I had I have two or three people from this group that chose to do the Sweet Annie, the Ching Hao. And a few people were like, I'm invincible, I'm, malaria is not real, and they didn't take anything. And some people took the medication. I'm gonna just use the number three because I don't really remember anymore. Uh, it was a long, long time ago. None of my people got malaria. One person with a prescription med did get malaria. All of the people who took nothing got malaria. So I'm gonna say my protocol worked okay. <laughs> and um, I've also found that the Sweet Annie, uh, because it's antimicrobial for people, especially if they're traveling to places where water quality, the risk of amoebic dysentery and things, although it's not specific for that, it does seem to be somewhat protective from um, bad food uh, intestinal issues. Um, I had one couple that was went and spent, I think, three months in southern India. Again, lots of exposure. She didn't take it. He did. She got food poisoning multiple times while she was there. He may just have a cast iron stomach but didn't get anything. Um, I don't think any of my people who have taken it have ever actually had any kind of stomach problems as well. The problem is Sweet Annie is really strong, really bitter. Um, it is related to wormwood um, and you can't take it if you're pregnant. Um, I would use caution if you had liver enzymes that were elevated and it is contraindicated with any narrow therapeutic margin uh, drugs. And, and sorry, I said that word earlier and I didn't explain it. There you go. Uh, okay. uh, the narrow therapeutic margin herbs are ones that if you take too much, bad things happen. And if you don't get enough, bad things happen. So think um, seizure medications is a good example. If you just all of a sudden don't get your seizure medications, it'll cause a seizure. That would be bad. Um, if you take too much of a seizure medication, you might die. So if we change the absorption and excretion of a particular medication because of an herb being very bitter and strong effect on your uh, liver, it has the potential to change the dosing on it. Um, so this one definitely affects your liver. If you had some kind of compromised liver function, it might be a concern. And I would argue that if you had gallstones, the bitter flavor might stimulate your gallbladder to try to spit those bad daddies out. So we shouldn't all go out and buy all the sweet Annie and start taking it every day for prevention. But if you're like, I think I'm gonna go hiking in the swamp at sunset, you might consider taking it. Um, I usually start with five grams daily um, for prevention for a set period of time. Uh, I have people, I usually tell people like test it before you go just to make sure A, you're gonna drink that nasty stuff. Um, making an infusion of tea or you use the Chinese five to one concentrate, that way you only need a gram, a gram of it in hot water. If you're going into a place with a high risk of malaria or you start to get symptoms, I will increase the frequency of it to up to 10 grams three times a day. Uh, Ching Hao, it's the uh, sweet Annie, uh, Artemisia annua. Um, and I encourage anybody, is, I, because I've only used it on travelers uh, who are out in, in some uh, risk of exposure for a short period of time, i.e. less than a couple of months, um, 
I'll have them continue to do it for two weeks after they return to the U.S. Because what would happen if they were bit by that mosquito as they got on the airplane and got malaria from that mosquito then? The research says, and not tradition, but research says that the sweet annie affects the second stage of development of the mosquito. So if you get by, bit by the mosquito, absolutely not, you have no symptoms for the first week or so. And then all of a sudden, magically, you start getting these alternating chills and fever. And you're like, oh, crap, I think I got malaria. In which case, then that's when the thing starts working its best. Uh, so it's one of those things where if you got it right away, uh, had it in your system, it never allows it to transfer into that second stage of development for the mosquito. Um, the other thing that is helpful, you're like, crap, I've got malaria. And oops, helps if I know what I'm typing. Sure. Um, there's a classic Chinese formula called Shao Chai Hu Tong that once you get malaria, like, hey, if I got malaria tomorrow, I'm going to the hospital, I want some drugs. Um, although I might use the Ching Hao. Um, but a lot of people get malaria, they get the treatment, and it becomes a chronic disease where periodically at times of stress, when their immune system gets run down, they start getting those alternating chills and fevers, they're bedridden for a week or two, sometimes hospitalized. So this uh, formula called Shao Chai Hu Tong, minor blue chlorum formula, is specific for chronic malaria and um, I'm going to say I've used, I've, oddly enough I've treated dengue fever, mal uh, chronic malaria, uh, chikungunya, usually in the chronic phase. Most people go to the hospital when they first get it. Um, the other thing that can be helpful oddly enough is one we mentioned earlier Dangguai is also used for chronic malaria, and uh, Hishowu. Oops. Uh, Hishowu is also known as Fo T, um, which is actually, there's a long story I'll spare you all, uh, but it's a polygonum, and uh, it translates to Mr. Black's, uh, Mr. He's Black Hair. There you go, Co coffee's wearing out. I obviously have a chocolate deficiency. Um, so the reality is all of these can be effective. We choose one over the other based on how uh, somebody's symptoms present um, as we get to know the herbs or the formulas uh, on how best to approach it. The other one that we're going to start seeing um, probably more and more often, again, a tropical one that is not rare, is dengue fever, and dengue fever I hear sucks. A lot of pain associated with it, very high fevers, and um, just like malaria can lead to death, especially for anybody with compromised immune system, very old, very young. Um, but the biggest problem is it causes anemia by destroying your platelets, and so that destruction of platelets can lead to death. It's also why there's a lot of pain associated with dengue fever. Uh, in both the Caribbean, uh, throughout the, the tropics there, as well as um, in the Philippines and the Pacific, uh, the leaf of papaya is the primary approach to protect the platelets while you're getting other treatments. So the, the papaya leaf is not a treatment for the dengue fever, it helps to make you survive the dengue fever. It's really important to, to differentiate. You're not going to sit there and drink papaya uh, leaf tea and magically be cured. But it would be appropriate to do the papaya leaf if you suspect that you've, uh, you're getting dengue, how should you get to the hospital and have a friend bring it to you. Uh, and as soon as you're discharged from the hospital or whatever, you know, I don't actually remember what the medication is for dengue fever. Um, but continuing to drink the papaya tea to ensure that your platelet levels are maintained. And although it's, it's known specifically to do that, um, it's also not wrong to drink the papaya leaf if you have low platelets for any other reason. Um, 
but it's important to figure out why you got low platelets. Like if you're anemic of some sort, don't just think, I'll just drink this tea and change my numbers. Figure out the how come as well. So it, it's a nice stop gap um, as you're trying to repair. In the case of the dengue, it does have generally a short lifespan. Um, so you, once you recover after a few weeks, uh, you're good. And eh, it's seven o'clock. All right, for all you newbies, I'm gonna give you the station identification. Uh, if you don't know, I'm Bob Lindy. I'm a registered herbalist and acupuncture physician here in sunny and oh so hot uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And um, uh, this is brought to you by the Tradition School of Herbal Studies, which has both Chinese and Western and standalone classes uh, from beginner to clinician uh, that I don't think we have anything starting until September or October, but that's okay. Um, we also have a student clinic three nights a week for uh, both herbalists and acupuncturists. Uh, I have acupuncturists and, and acupuncturists there on Wednesday nights. Uh, hopefully I'll have some more next semester uh, from our local uh, East West College and Dragon Rises, uh, both of the acupuncture schools here in our area. And Monday night we do more Chinese medicine. Tuesday night is Western Herb Student Clinic and Wednesday night is more Chinese herb uh, student clinic. And I think it's $15 to be seen by one of the students and they can, they're supervised by me or one of the other senior practitioners here and uh, they can handle challenging stuff. If you come to see a student clinic or uh, during, during the six days a week, we have practitioners there, uh, both herbalists and acupuncturists, bring blood work, bring your supplements. The more information, the better. You'll never overwhelm us. I literally just had somebody recently brought in an inch thick stuff from Mayo Clinic and John Hopkins and everything else. It was like, it's gonna take me a little while, but I'll get there. Um, we've got two, a couple of classes coming up that are open for the general public. The physical assessment for the herbalist that uh, Trisha and I teach. I do more of the herb stuff. She does the physical assessment stuff because she's way better than me super appropriate for massage therapist, acupuncturist, or herbalist. Um, I, I would say don't be afraid, it's, but it is somewhat more advanced uh, because I talk about some crazy stuff with the herbs and it's really geared, geared towards the practitioner. We've got a uh, medicine making class is on corn silk on July 13th. Um, anatomy for the herbalist on the immune system on the 20th. Our uh, young person's uh, herbal uh, class is part of the series, soothing and cooling. So really geared for those teenagers or a little bit older for rather than just talking about medicinal, like how do we use herbs to just feel better? Soothing and cooling sounds right so you can enjoy your summer vacation. And our next open forum is on the 28th. Um, and remember, you can find out more about the clinic at AccuHerbals1C, uh, uh, AccuHerbals.com, and the clinic is at 2520 Central Avenue, and you can come and see one of the practitioners there or one of the students. Um, you can also, we've got a full apothecary there with over 800 herbs from around the world, both Western and Chinese, that you can buy by the gram. And you can do walk-in, uh, vitamin and homeopathic injections from everybody but me because it wasn't even in our scope of practice when I got licensed and I never took the class. So it's got to be one of the other folks there, but six days a week, there's somebody there. Um, and many of our classes are, oh, I'm going to say most of our classes are online as well as in person. Um, the one exception is the flower essence class coming up in August that is uh, geared towards certification, although you can just take part of it. Um, that one is open to anybody as well. Ba, ba, ba. What am I forgetting about? Oh, and the school, you can find out more information at traditionsherbschool.com. Although you can find out more at the uh, clinic at 2520, all of our classes are held here at the school at uh, 6340 Central Avenue in St. Petersburg. <gasps> Oops, and I lost my screen for some reason. Holy crap, that is not good. Hopefully it did not drop everything. No, good. Um, and if you're just joining us, feel free to let us know who you are. And if you've got any questions, shout them out. Okay, type them in. Um, and we will add them to the queue because I'm not, I don't have too many things. All right. I thought malaria was going to take way longer. That went easier than I thought. Oh, and um, for any acupuncturists who are online listening to my gibberish, uh, Florida State Oriental Medicine Association, which is our state professional organization, 
Uh, oh, good. <laughs> My computer's being weird. Um, there are conferences in Fort Lauderdale this year, August 25th to 27th. Although certainly anybody can go, it's very, um, how oh, awesome. Um, it's very accu heavy. So unless you're an acupuncture student, um, it's not as appropriate. Next year, it'll be uh, a nice mix that for some of the herb students studying Chinese medicine would be super appropriate. Um, our next AHG chapter will be here at the school, uh, July 22nd at 5.30. I think we're gonna do show and tell is a, not really what we're going to do, but um, Alex, uh, the, um, <laughs> I forget the moniker he always goes by. Alex, the dude who just went to South Africa and knows some cool stuff about South African plants um, is going to come and tell us a little bit about his trip and always has some interesting herbs that he brings back and has available. Um, one of the favorites he turned me on to was baobab uh, that is an amazing, it's the upside down tree, it's a very spiritual tree. Um, he's got thousands of things to say about it and uh, it's because of him I planted some here. Um, so in a hundred years we'll have a tree that's bigger than the clinic. Um, hopefully it does not eat the entire property here. Uh, and the AHG uh, National Conference is coming up in October 13th through the 18th in Granby, Colorado. Um, I'm not teaching there because I teach every other year, at least I hope that they select me to teach every other year. Um, but they always ask if you taught the uh, one year to skip the next year. Um, they do a good job of making sure it's Everybody gets a shot who's interested in teaching um, so we can get some the up and coming herbalists to get in there. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the American Herbalist Guild, I encourage you to check it out. It is our professional organization that looks out for us. They've been around for a long time. I don't know. I think this is the 37th, uh, 30 something uh, annual conference. It changes location every year. It's available to anybody. You can join as a general member, a student member, if you're actively enrolled in a school. Um, oh, cool. Uh, and uh, you, my goal for every herbalist, although it's certainly not a requirement, is the RH, the registered herbalist. It's always intimidating when you first see it, uh, but it is, um, all you gotta do is kind of sit there and kind of check all the stuff out, and they do classes just on how to get your RH. There's some new levels of membership also that's geared less towards the practitioner and more towards um, wild harvesters and medicine makers and things like that. So they really try to be as inclusive as humanly possible. Um, yeah, I, I hate to say it, I've never seen, other than the small one we have here, I've never seen a large uh, baobab, but I hear they are amazing, powerful, medicinal food. Um, they, there are whole communities that live inside a baobab tree. I, I wish I could say with great authority uh, a lot, but I can't. <laughs> um, all right, let me make one more double check. Feel free to shout out if you got any questions. I end up talking to the screen and ignoring anybody that's sitting here. We actually have a live person here. Yay. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna keep going. Where's my oh my scribbliness is crazy talk. Oh, I was gonna do talk some about that. So it's really funny. We touched on it a little bit um, earlier about how we can use um, herbs for orthopedic issues, and it's always interesting we think about pain killing herbs we think about a few things for acute injuries but most people when they think about um, herbal medicine they're usually focused on either chronic conditions or colds and flu antimicrobial or let's maintain our health and not a lot of like you know and you had asked uh, like oh my, you know your significant other had fallen off his bike and got a big old hematoma how can I use herbs to address that? Um, when we think about orthopedics, that can be muscular, skeletal, uh, it can be ligaments and tendons, fascia, all of that kind of falls under that. And that can be both acute and chronic things. We can look at degenerative kind of issues as well as uh, injuries. Um, and most people, when they're dealing with orthopedic stuff, you go to an orthopedic surgeon and you get either 
Um, physical therapy, which is great. You need physical therapy. Uh, you can get, um, get steroid injections, which in case you didn't know it, you're not supposed to get more than three steroid injections in any single location. Um, I think that is occasionally broken. Um, and they're not fixing anything and they have a host of other potential side effects. The same vein, I also say people shouldn't suffer. So if you need to get a steroid injection short term to be able to function while you fix stuff, um, that is preferable. And of course, surgery, uh, anti-inflammatories, and um, a number of other prescription medications can be used for orthopedic stuff. And herbs are phenomenal, either as the primary approach or to uh, back up things like surgery and so forth, and not just for acute issues. It can be used for chronic issues as well. So some of the, the faves for acute injuries, comfrey topically is an amazing magical herb. Uh, any kind of closed wound trauma to include fractures, it can be dramatic. Um, literally in the space of a few hours, cut swelling, and when you cut the swelling, you cut the pain, uh, in half or better, uh, mashing it up. And although I love it fresh, if you don't happen to grow it, you should grow it. Uh, you can use the dried leaf or root. Um, they're very similar. If it's an open wound, I use great caution with it because it in and i'm not one to talk chemicals and alkaloids but it does can uh, contain an alkaloid allotonin um, which is extracted and patented um, and stimulates the skin to grow very fast in to the point of ridiculous how fast it can make it grow which if you have a puncture wound if you have debris in a wound um, it will cause the skin to grow over it and that can cause uh, anaerobic bacteria to get trapped in there, and it can get really gross and festering, which would be bad. So um, although it can be used on like a little bit of road rash or something, a little abrasion, um, I, any kind of deeper wound, something that's got stitches, uh, I use great caution with it. You can use it, in, and let's just say like, oh, you, you know, had some trauma, you've got stitches, don't put it on top of the stitches, but you can put it to the side and it will work more as an anti-inflammatory than if you put it on there and it grows too fast, uh, blocking stuff in. Uh, and a short aside, if you have a deeper wound, plantain, not the banana, but the weed, plantago, uh, and any species of plantago will do, uh, is better for deeper wounds and punctures. It grows from inside up. Uh, so it's an option. But the comfrey for acute injuries like that uh, is phenomenal for tendon or skeletal issue. Uh, excuse me. For tendon, ligament, or um, spinal issues, I really love uh, Solomon Seal. And it can be combined, especially for the spine, with mullein, M-U-L-L-E-I-N. And ideally, although some people use the mullein leaf, the root is best for the low, uh, the low back, so lumbar sacral. I find the aerial part, the stalk, is better for thoracic and cervical spine issues. But phenomenal when it's combined with uh, the Solomon seal. It really helps to generate the synovial fluids, the juice that's inside the joint. Um, and the Solomon seal, so effective for tendon repair, um, for people who are like, twisted their ankle, twisted their uh, knee, and it's like, oh, I don't need surgery because it didn't tear or detach, but they're in pain, the joint is unstable. Solomon Seal is magical. Um, it helps to restore that uh, tendon back to its normal place. 
It can be used internally or topically. I consider it food, so I don't think about herb-drug interactions with that. And there is a Chinese version of it that can be used called Huang Jing, which is same genus, different species of Solomon seal as the American one. Um, that one can be used safely. I actually think it tastes good. It's been steamed. The Chinese like to process stuff a lot. I do not recommend the other thing that they list as Solomon seal, which is yuzhu. The yuzhu um, causes some nausea, um, stomach pain, uh, and does not seem to have any of the same benefits as the Huang Jing or the American Solomon seal. So it's the only one, and it's a lot of Chinese herbalists arguers like, no, it's not the same. Yes, it is. I've got the same results. I didn't. And, and so they really struggle, but it's important that we get the right version of it. So Huang Jing good, Yuzhu not. I actually don't use Yuzhu at all. Um, arnica is always an interesting one. Arnica is actually a, a mild or a medium toxicity herb. So the plant itself generally is not something that's good to chow down on or make teas out of. Uh, it's also used for acute injuries. I prefer with uh, Arnica the homeopathic version. And so homeopathic uh, herbs generally less risk of um, herb drug interactions, uh, better safety profile, and um, can be used pre and post surgical. And obviously, unless you know you're going to have an accident, just post accident <laughs> too. And I would say in the first week, you can join us if you want. It's, <laughs> it's open to everybody. Uh, and so that one you can usually find at a health food store. It's a good thing to have in your first aid kit uh, and really speeds the healing along a great deal. Calendula is another one. Again, just nice to have a calendula salve for any kind of um, acute injury uh, of stuff. Um, and particularly salves, you can use it internally, but making it uh, calendula is a trick if you're making a tincture, an alcohol extraction out of it. Um, it needs a higher proof alcohol because the resins in there um, are harder to get out and do better with like a 160, 170 or higher uh, percentage alcohol. So um, kind of a trick to get that out if you're going to use, even though it's a flower, you have to boil the crap out of it. Uh, also really good for uh, uh, autoimmune, chronic, um, uh, inflammatory gut stuff. So I think Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, the, that's particularly good for healing the gut as well. And sometimes only a few doses can really make a dramatic impact on those uh, gastrointestinal issues. Where do we go for? Let's look at some chronic inflammatory stuff. Um, for connective tissue, uh, issues um, and fascia I particularly like and it's it's so underutilized and I probably so overutilize it go to cola is absolutely magical uh, so that's centella asiatica there's also native to Florida although opinions vary is centella erecta they're interchangeable neither one is better than the other they taste profile is so similar I think it has more to do with soil and light uh, rather than species. Um, most people think about it as it's good for the brain, helps with memory, yay. Uh, the reality is I think what it's doing is reducing the inflammation in the brain from any number of different issues. Um, but it is well known uh, as a anti-inflammatory for your connective tissues. Um, and that can be fascia, tendons, ligaments, and so forth. I love combining it for brain stuff with rosemary and bacopa, bacopa mononeri, and sometimes ginkgo biloba. The problem is that ginkgo is specific for people with a lot of phlegm. So if you don't have phlegm, if you're not like snot fest all the time, thick coating on your tongue, ginkgo will actually be do more harm than good because it will dry out those tissues and probably just make you irritable. <laughs> um, so ginkgo, sometimes good, sometimes not. Uh, and research kind of 
follows. It's a 50% effective for age-related memory decline. I would say they never looked at the energetics of those individuals, unfortunately. Um, the go-to cola and the bacopa for memory commonly uh, put together, I change the ratio of those based on uh, the bacopa is got a relaxing aspect and slightly more moistening where the go-to cola is slightly drying. So if you're kind of uh, ADHD, hyper, um, always throwing back the ice drinks, you need more bacopa. If you're kind of, I don't know, ADD, wandering around and a little phlegmy, a little uh, achy, then more go-to cola. Rosemary is good for everybody. No, <laughs> rosemary is a great addition um, and kind of increases the blood flow. Um, go-to cola is also my, one of my go-tos, not as a single, but in formula for fibromyalgia. When we look at that um, inflammatory fascia connective tissue, it is phenomenal. Go-to cola is also one of my go-tos for um, autism. Um, especially the uh, nonverbal kids. I watch such a shift when I add as much, go-to call is food. Make, use that instead of spinach if you're cooking a meal for them. Make tea out of it, put it in a smoothie, make it a cooked green, and save a buck, grow your own. It's very, very easy to grow here. You can grow it in a pot, you can grow it in the ground. It's a beautiful ground cover. If you got a little bit wetter area somewhere, sun or shade, it doesn't care. Um, let's think about some antispasmodics. My personal favorite because of its easy accessibility here in Florida because, well, in Tampa Bay in particular is uh, Cava Cava. So um, Piper Methysticum is uh, a anti-anxiety, antispasmodic, ceremonial, recreational, you name it. Um, and I know we got at least one massage therapist on there. Yes, uh, go to cola. And sorry, I sometimes I um, let me type that in if I can find where the typey place is. There it is. Um, go to cola, which is uh, the fancy name, centella. Uh, I'm going to say any centella. Um, and oh, and I forgot to say. Be careful of your stupid plant ID apps. They're wrong most of the time. Um, in particular, dollar weed, which is a common weed in your yard if you're overwatering, especially. There's many different types of uh, is it hydrocolon. I never know how to say it's genus. There's a bunch of those. Those are not go-to cola. Um, although they won't kill you, they are edible and medicinal. They don't have the same effect. Um, and so make sure that you're getting actual centella asiatica. You can go on Google, you look at all the pictures, they'll have pictures of both. I've watched herbalists who are decent herbalists make that mistake many times. Um, so it's one of my pet peeves, sorry. Um, so kava, antispasmodic. For massage therapists out there, everyone should be making a kava salve so kava kava as a topical muscle antispasmodic is magical um, it doesn't have a strong smell it's very easy to do a oil extraction with it um, and anywhere but especially that neck and shoulders area it's just a, a great addition it can be used internally as well as externally um, the other one that people don't talk enough about it has a horrible common name, louse wart. Um, it's not a louse. Uh, wart, by the way, W-O-R-T, like St. John's wart and so forth, just means herb uh, in Old English. Uh, pedicularis. I think I spelled that right. Pedicularis is, um, I've not found it in Florida yet. I found it in uh, Georgia all over the place and I was up there for the Medicine of the Earth conference and went and did some wild harvesting found massive amounts of pedicularis um, uh, about a month or so ago we got from one of our uh, plant growers we had them ship us like 20 pounds of it as it went into flower um, 
it grows throughout the world. So it's known in Europe, Scandinavia, and a number of other places. And they all have very similar uses. So internally primarily, but it can be used externally as well. Um, Antispasmodic, uh, generate tissue healing, uh, as well as um, uh, specific for skeletal muscles. And, and I differentiate that because we've got like a bicep, it's like, oh, I hurt that. Something like Kaba might be better. But when we look at the muscles that are around the spine itself, and that's everything from the psoas to a bunch of others, those, A, they're hard for massage therapists to get in there enough to change them. They're the ones that cause probably half of our chronic back pain, and they don't respond very well. Acupuncture is good at it, but you know, what's something that we can take internally or use topically? to release those so that we can do better yoga uh, <laughs> or any other kind of exercise they may want to do, but also just to get out of pain. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, i got a little bit of time. Left. So if anybody's just jumping on here, feel free to let us know who you are. And if you've got any questions, please shout them out. That goes for you guys too. Uh, <laughs> all right, I make sure I didn't miss anybody. All right, I think I got everybody. Um, what are my other favorite pain ones? Um, Metasweet's one that's forgotten a lot. Uh, Metasweet, I've grown it here. I will not say it belongs here. This is definitely more North Carolina North. This is um, the best place I ever saw it. It was growing wild was in Scotland. I spent a couple of weeks at the Scottish School of Herbalism and I will say it was a roadside weed in Scotland. Uh, and it was, the flowers are divine. It has the most beautiful smell. I can't even describe it, um, but it's a, a heavier smell. It does have, um, Metasweet has in it salicylic acid, which is where aspirin comes from. So, you know, you'd say, don't give aspirin to anybody uh, younger than 18, otherwise it um, can cause kind of some, oh, I think that's pedicularis. Oh, the metasweet. Hopefully you got, you mean the pedicularis. I think I spelt it right. Um, or you can Google elsewhere. Um, so the metasweet is, um, we don't know, like we have uh, willow and metasweet are both a source for salicylic acid. That's where it originally came from. Does it cause the Ray's syndrome the same way as aspirin? I have no idea. Uh, oh, the Scottish, yes. Uh, and, uh, ooh, man, asking me to spell is hard. Meadowsweet. <laughs> Meadowsweet. Um, so it used to have, um, it used to have the Latin name Spirea. I don't remember what the Latin name is anymore because I only know the old names. So the Latin name was Spirea. That's where the name aspirin came from, Aspirea. Everybody says the white willow bark is like, no, that's a, that's a salix. Spirea, and then they changed the name, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. I hate it when the botanists change the names of plants. Um, it just confuses me. Um, uh, usually I think they're white flowers. Um, and yeah, there's the Scottish School of Herbalism is there. Um, uh, Keith and Danny, uh, mostly Keith, uh, run it there periodically. They do like two week sessions up there. That they, they do really cool stuff. Nice people, beautiful property there. Um, it's on the Isle, Isle of Aran. Don't ask me to spell that. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's a fun place. Can salicylic acid like it's in cosmetics to help with acne? It can it can be in that. It's mostly in aspirin, but I think they put salicylic acid in. I have like face it, lash that yeah and it's the That's same thing connection. yeah and so it does have a blood thinning property to it um and when we look at it in things like cosmetics especially acne things it's breaking down some of that surface uh, tissue especially in the glands that they get blocked so it's trying yeah. to break that up in the same way people That's take right. aspirin to stop what clots right. so it's the same principle we just do it on the outside instead of the inside uh, similar properties. So um, Metasweet can be used just kind of in the same way you might take an aspirin for um, hot inflammatory diseases, right? Because we use it, hey, 
Uh, we use it for fevers, right? So we can use Metasweet for pain-related fevers. Um, but also, if I twist my ankle, it's going to turn red, hot, and swollen. So we can use it internally for those kinds of things as well. Uh, but my thing it's, it's so often forgotten about is the digestive on top of it. So um, it helps with um, really phlegmy, um, boggy kind of digestion where everything you eat and drink, you just kind of like create some phlegminess, <laughs> you know, if you have pizza and beer, that kind of stuff. Um, and personal Bob belief here, uh, that it's not only just drying up or helping to break down that phlegm, it, it's known to help over time uh, stimulate some of the glands in the stomach that produce hydrochloric acid. And if you don't, you're supposed to have hydrochloric acid in your stomach. That's what helps sterilize your food. It helps to break down your proteins. Uh, it helps to absorb your minerals. Um, it allows you to absorb B12. Uh, and lots of other cool stuff. So certainly the short answer is take some hydrochloric acid if you've got low stomach acid, which is super common, sadly. Um, but the, some people are like, yeah, I'm not taking a pill. So MetaSweet is one of my go-tos for helping to slowly and painfully, but it will get there in time. Um, that plus alfalfa and fenugreek all seem to have some benefit for generating um, stomach acid. Ah, man, I'm doing good. Y'all got to ask me more questions. <laughs> and make sure I'm not missing anything. All right. Um, what are my other trauma herbs? Uh, one that's forgotten usually uh, is black cohosh. For Appian, ooh, <laughs> Kohosh. Let me hit Black Kohosh, and I'm going to come back and talk about sleep apnea because I, I might have some interesting approaches to that. So everybody thinks Black Kohosh is for menopause. Yeah, it's okay for that, whatever. It's not actually that effective. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, black Kohosh in Chinese medicine is an herb called Shengma, and even though they're the same genus, they're different species, they're used interchangeably all the time. A lot of our Western black cohosh is actually adulterated with the Chinese one. It's not an adulteration, it's just where they got it from. Um, oh, yes, uh, thank you. Th this will be on YouTube when we're done. Uh, so I upload all of our um, uh, herbal open forums. I upload them all to the Traditions Herb School's uh, YouTube page. So the last couple of years of me babbling incoherently are all up there uh, on any who knows what subjects, you name it, I've babbled about it. Um, so black cohosh is particularly good for um, lower abdominal spasms and uh, lower skeletal muscles as well. Um, so it's one of my go-tos for uh, really painful menses. For women who have a tilted uterus, it can be helpful for relaxing some of those. And it's unfortunately, it's a real common cause of really crappy menses as well as infertility. Um, black cohosh. Um, fibroids sometimes. Um, fibroids are harder. And can you do me a huge favor and close that front door? Because I can't talk. <laughs> Sorry. And I will talk about fibroids too. Or even the front door, if that one won't close. Yeah, yeah. there's just a brick in front of it there. Kick it out. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to stall while she goes and closes the door because uh, the DJ just started. It is the downside of during, doing this during a, uh, uh, whatchamathingy, by market. Because i got to deal with everybody walking through and rocking out. So I'm sure the drums will start in a second. So don't worry, I'm going to keep talking. Oh no, I'm stalling, ha. Huh. Yeah, perfect, thank you. I didn't say anything, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, um, so black cohosh, so I'm gonna do an end run here. 
So fibroids, I always think of, there's a thousand different reasons. They're affected by hormones sometimes, they're affected by uh, the food we eat. But I always think about like a lot of people end up getting those fibroids as they get older, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on. So as we twist and bend and loose, uh, lift things and walk funny and injure ourselves, everything gets misaligned. Everything in our body gets a little out of whack. And um, I always think of it as an internal blister. It's not per se, um, but the reality is, why does it form? It frequently forms there in the abdomen and it's associated with uh, the uterus and, and the ovaries and so forth. And when you look at some of the, the anatomy and physiology of the, the female reproductive organs in particular, there's this huge number of ligaments and fascia. There's like just this web that keeps it where it's supposed to be. So all we need is one step off the curb, one I lifted something too heavy for one of those ligaments to just spasm a little bit. They pull things out of whack. Five years later, you've got a fibroid. Um, so there are lots of herbs that you know, you can use progesterone and estrogen and we alter hormone levels and we can use these phlegm dispersing herbs and all that. Those are all correct. They're, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the reality is I was like, something's out of whack sometimes. And so looking at things that maybe have that antispasmodic function. Um, there's also um, a technique that I'm a huge fan of that I don't know how to do. So you have to find somebody. Uh, my abdominal massage um, and so that that is a combination of physical therapy massage uh, and some Central American Mayan techniques that is specific for the fascia and so forth and I've seen it have phenomenal success uh, for fibroids and correcting some of those imbalances uh, and it's always uh, like, hopefully everybody here listening has had a massage at some point in their life. Hopefully you're getting it a lot. It's good for you. Um, but the reality is they work on every, like they'll go inside your mouth and massage for the really, ain't nobody touching your belly. Personally, this is where my stress resides. It's always in, in my belly. And so it's, although it's geared towards women for menstrual stuff, fertility, fibroids, uh, painful menses, um, it is just as appropriate for men to get it for everything from digestive health to prostate health. Um, and to, if you Google my abdominal massage, there's a website that should all the people who are certified in it. Um, you you, um, Mayan, um, uh, M -A, ooh, M -A -Y -A -N, abdominal, I'm a horrible speller. Um, and it's the... Oh my God, what's her name? Uh, Avigo, I, yeah, I don't remember. You'll see it when you Google that. Uh, there's, there's two people in this area, only one of which I've, I know. She used to work uh, at the clinic, uh, but then she started her own practice. She literally, I heard she's booked a year out. Um, so uh, it's, it's impressive. I've, I've had that work done once. Even though she's not like sticking elbows in your belly, it was the most intense massage ever. And it had phenomenal outcomes for my digestive health. Um, so I'm sure it's equally as, and that was just from one session. Uh, and so I encourage it for anybody. Um, all right, good, I got more questions. All right, um, so black cohosh, musculoskeletal. No, no, that's all right. We got 20 minutes, 15 minutes. All right, let me get sleep apnea in there. Oh, and fibroids, no, we said fibroid stuff. Might have done on the side. Um, sleep apnea is a very common problem. It's more common, and I gotta write down the word gallstones, yeah, stones. Um, it's more common in people who are overweight, but it is not limited to people who are overweight. Uh, so one of the approaches we, you know, we certainly look at is, um, man, everybody's waiting till the end to give me good questions. No. Oh. Good idea. I will. Uh, who is it? definitely like shout that out at me for next session because I can certainly talk about cool stuff. Um, and if you ever come up for one of our herb walks, that would be awesome because then I can show you. Um, so 
sleep apnea is basically you stop breathing and there's any number of different reasons and it's while you're sleeping that would be bad i hear breathing's good for you um the outcome of like yay so you're irritating if you snore you probably have sleep apnea and should get a sleep study the reason that's important is a if you're like I sleep eight hours, but I wake up exhausted every single morning and you're like using like more and more coffee to stimulants to get through your day. You may be asleep, but not getting rest. You're not getting to that deeper level of sleep that your body needs to recover. The link between heart disease and sleep apnea is huge. So from a screw whether you're rested or not, but that has all kinds of hormone implications and, and so forth. It is vital for you for your heart health. Like the risk of heart disease is dramatically sped up um, if you're dealing with sleep apnea. Uh, also for folks who are actively trying to lose weight and they're like, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to, why am I not losing weight? And they are not dealing with their sleep apnea. That's probably why. It's very hard to lose weight if you're not getting rest. Um, so everybody help hates the CPAP and the BiPAP and all the cool machines. Even if you just wear it for half the night and get pissed off and throw it, do it, whatever you can take. Make sure you clean your CPAP. I'm saying things because I've had too many patients who have these chronic respiratory and sinus issues because they never clean their stupid CPAP. Uh, so it's so important that you do that. Um, that said, one of the reasons why people get sleep apnea is the uvula, the little hangy downy thing in the back of your throat, um, that it is in a lax state and falls down and blocks your throat while you're sleeping. Um, that's qi deficiency in Chinese medicine, lax tissue in a, a Western herbal construct. They now do uvula tucks to cure sleep apnea if that's your problem. That's not always the problem. So some people uh, that is an issue and that is an effective cure for sleep apnea when it's an issue it's not common yet but it is done um, if it is a if it is a lax tissue of the uvula then things like astragalus um, which is a chinese herb but also western called huang chi or a Chinese formula that is specific for things that are lax and falling down called Buzong Yi Chi Tong. There we go. Um, is frequently used for that. A lot of times looking at, you know, why, you know, if we look at the People are frequently overweight that are dealing with that. How do we help them? There is any number of different ways. Um, helping to normalize thyroid function, to balance hormones out, uh, getting the doctors to actually test the hormones the way they ought to, not just the TSH, but doing a full thyroid panel. Um, but there's also, uh, what's the new weight loss thing on all the commercials, Noom, that looks at the psychology of why people eat the way they do which I find fascinating because there's any number, like I, I was brought up, you know, the clean plate club. It was like, uh, we were, it was Bangladesh, we were, you know, the UNICEF, we were always raising money for Bangladesh was having some horrible thing that happened to them. And so it's like, we're the starving children in Bangladesh. And so we had to eat anything on their plate. So I would clean everything on my plate. And, you know, with my grandmother, that's how we, she showed she loved us, where she piled more yummy food on there. So. If I want to repeat, show how much I love my grandmother, I will stuff my pie hole to the point of obesity. Luckily, I have a fast metabolism, I can get away with it. And, and so I really like that figuring that out, the why. I generally am a healthy eater. Um, I am gluttonous, so I do like to eat too much stuff, but I mostly just eat bad stuff at night. Like I'll be done, I'll get home about nine o'clock tonight, review my stuff for my class tomorrow, and I'm gonna sit there and eat something crappy. If it's available, I'm gonna eat it. So there's an herb, um, oh, I'm not gonna spell this right, oh well. Gynema, if anybody knows how to spell this better than me, I know it's wrong. Uh, so, 
three. I'm close. Uh, I'm missing a letter there on the top. Uh, Gynema Silvestri, it's um, the Sanskrit name for it is Gumar. Gumar, the destroyer of sugar. This herb uh, helps with blood sugar issues somewhat. It increases pancreatic function. For, ah, there you go. Thank you. I, I, was, I was close, super close. Um, uh, and there are herbs that sound like that. So Sylvester, I always just remember Sylvester the cat. Um, this one will make sugar taste bad. So if it's like, oh, I like all those treats at night and I always get permission from my clients beforehand, but if you make a tea out of this, and I think it's important to say it's a tea, um, it will change for about 30 minutes to an hour. Sweet things don't taste good anymore. They just, they're not bad, they're just off. And part of a cookie or a piece of candy or something like that is because it tastes, it, you know, we like the rush from the sugar, but it tastes good. So we can use that for those late night snackers and eaters as a way to modify their behavior and make it not yummy. Interesting time to get a chainsaw out, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> Um, what other weight loss ones do I like? Things that help with phlegm. And as long as somebody said, cool herbs that we can grow uh, here in Florida, there's a Florida native, uh, Smilax, uh, which is also the Chinese herb, Tu Fu Ling, is a nice anti-inflammatory and gets rid of phlegm uh, and will tighten up loose tissues. If we're looking at blood sugar regulation, we can use the uh, bitter melon, uh, which is also a Florida native, the Surisi here in Florida. So it's literally exploding. We'll do that on the herb walk here in a little bit. Um, all of those can be helpful. So sleep apnea is a pain in the ass, honestly. Um, so I'm gonna do one last one. Somebody said gallstones. Um, Gallstones, it's important to differentiate between gallstones and uh, uh, kidney stones. So the herbs, although a lot of herbs say they work on both, there's usually, they'll work way better on one and crapshoot for the other. Uh, I will say, please, 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 if you're listening to this, uh, bitter melon, heck yeah. Uh, you can grow that any, in Texas. It, it grows all over the tropics and subtropics. Please don't do a gallbladder flush. If you actually have gallstones, you're gonna probably end up in the hospital with emergency surgery on your gallbladder and lose it. And once you lose it, there ain't no fixing it. You're like, it's gone. Um, the gallbladder flush, if you take the, what is it? It's like, uh, sometimes it's apple cider vinegar, it's olive oil, and you're supposed to do, yeah, some cayenne pepper, or maple syrup. If you took that and threw bile acids and threw them in a jar and shake them up, you get tar balls. So all you're doing is you're stressing out your gallbladder, causing it to spasm, and it makes tar balls just like the tar on the beach. Um, because you start pooping out things that are like this big and then they get smaller and smaller. Your biliary duct, where that gallstone has to come out, is about that big. There's no, no marble is coming out of that. <laughs> So literally what happens, you're like, I have people tell me this all the time. It's like, no, I was putting out these golf balls and then there were just like, you know, grapes and then there was just like little things and then I got rid of all of them. I was like, A, your gallbladder is like maybe that big. So it didn't hold all of that. But also your gallbladder just quit. It just stopped trying. And that's why you stop making those tar balls. Um, there is case study after case study of, um, people ended up with emergency surgery from that um, gallbladder flush. One of the worst things that uh, Natural Health puts out. If you want to read a longer version of that, if you, um, oh my God, his name just flew out of my head. Oh, that's what happens when I vomit information for two hours. Um, I think Jim McDonald published something, but uh, nope, uh, the Southwest School of Herbal Studies, nope, I don't remember. If anybody wants it, email me uh, at the school, traditionsherbschool at gmail.com and I'll send you a copy of the longer version from the guy I can't think of. Um, it, it's interesting to say the least, it's like four pages long. Um, that said, 
there are two ways to approach gallstones. Um, I like it when we have somebody who's gone to the GI doc and has had an ultrasound and they were like, yeah, you know, you better really stop eating that fried food. You're going to lose your gallbladder one day soon. Um, and it's sludgy. There's no stones, but it's sludgy. It's kind of inflamed. You know what? In five years, we're going to be cut that sucker out. Then doing things, and somebody mentioned this earlier, digestive bitters before meals is really effective, just bitter foods in general. Um, stimulate the liver to produce more bile, and the gallbladder stores the bile that we need to break down fats. Start watching your fried uh, saturated fats and just eat less of those. The digestive bitters kind of um, gently wakes up the gallbladder a little bit. Um, people who don't and, uh, have a low injection fracture where the, the gallbladder is not putting out enough juice sometimes. It's literally just like, eh, I don't feel like working today, I'm quit. Um, what about digestive bitters? Um, digestive, you can buy them. I There's Swedish bitters, which is more a uh, classic version of that uh, that was created, I think, in the 1800s. It's a decent one. I really... It's a bunch of herbs in, a, in alcohol, in a spray. Sometimes they're made in a vinegar. I really like, there's a company called Urban Moon, yeah, Urban Moonshine, that uh, I really like their products. Uh, Guido Masse is the formulator for that. He just does a nice job. Uh, he's, an, he's, he's geekier than me. Um, super smart dude, uh, mixes uh, medically kind of stuff with very traditional stuff. Urban moonshine, yes. Uh, and uh, I like a Chinese herb called gold coin herb. Uh, is so specific for helping to slowly break down gallstones. Um, there's that's sometimes used. <laughs> somebody who knows Guido, awesome. Uh, uh, the uh, yeah, we we have herbalist man crush on each other, I think. Um, but uh, the the gold coin herb, uh, Latin name is Lismachia. I have other than an L, I can't spell that to save my life. Um, nice thing about Latin, it's what it sounds like. Um, but that gold coin herb can be used in a nice low dose on a daily basis to slowly start to break down stones. Think six months to a year to slowly get them so that they can pass easily or ideally go away. The trick is, is don't continue to do the uh, cured fatty meats, the fried food, the french fries, all the things that are yummy. Those will just like instant just give up your gallbladder. So you really have to clean up the diet, work on um, more veggies, leaner meats. Would you use either or would you just focus on doing one, like the herbal one or the... The, the gold coin herb, if you made your own bitters, you could add that into it. Um, I would probably do both if... Uh, both are good. Both are definitely good. Um, and the gold coin herb you can do is literally make a tea uh, is the best way. The, um, there's a Florida native uh, plant uh, called Chanca Piedra, our stone breaker, uh, that is, nope, don't remember the Latin name. <laughs> I just wrote it the other day. Um, yeah, Chanca Piedra. Yeah, and it grows, it's growing right now. It's seasonal, uh, and there is a lookalike. Chanca Piedra. Piedra. No, with an A. Uh, no, that's better for kidney stones. There's a there's a little bit of research that shows it has benefit for gallstones. I don't trust it. It doesn't seem like it has a benefit. So, the kidney stones, chunka piedra, gold coin herb, gallstones. Oddly enough, uh, I had mentioned um, go to cola earlier, and that there was a lookalike, the dollar weed or pennywort. It's not great for gallstones. It's okay though. And so that's one that's free because it's already in your lawn. Make sure you get it from a safe place. It's usually in wet areas. So make sure that you heat it in some way. So don't just start eating it because amoebic dysentery is not fun. Uh, so, um, but the dollar weed or penny ward, those are the common names. Uh, and I totally can't think of what the Latin name is. But that one, 
grows everywhere. The marsh pennywort is probably the preferred one. Uh, and again, it's looking at that long and slow. It can be combined with the gold coin herb. Uh, there are classic Chinese formulas that are used for gallstones. Long, slow, low dosage is always the way to go. Chunka piedra is best for kidney stones, not gallstones. There is some, you'll see it quoted for having uh, benefit for the, the gallstones, but the uh, chunka, meh. <laughs> and again, don't hit it hard. Go low and slow to get rid of those kidney stones with that. Um, and that is my favorite one. Ah, yes, thank you. For <laughs> hey, Doc, thank you. That is the Latin name for the Chunka Piedra. And make sure that you're getting the right species. So there's a same genus, different species that has a mild toxicity. Uh, and you won't die if you ate it by accident, but you want to make sure you get the right one. And so the just you know do a little botany and look up the different ones the one that we want chunka piedra the Nerudi, is just starting to come out now and we'll have it until about october november then we'll, we won't find it much anymore but very very common plant all right i'm going to wrap this up if you haven't figured it out i'm bob lindy from tradition school of herbal studies and acupuncture and herbal therapies in sunny st petersburg you can find this uh on our youtube page for the school tradition school of herbal studies uh you'll find a the, the recording of this and all the last couple of years of this stuff so feel free to share it it's the last friday of every month we'll be here um and we're going to do an herb walk here in about Eh, five minutes or so. So um, be sure to send in questions, ideas, whatever to the school, traditionsherbschool at gmail.com. Check out the clinic's website, AccuHerbals, uh, AccuHerbals.com, and the school's website, traditionsherbschool.com. Hopefully I can still talk for a little while while I do an herb walk, and thank you all for showing up. See you next time. Huh? Okay, it didn't work. There we go. Yeah. <laughs>